Look at what happened in Copenhagen. 192 nations gathered to deal with the atmosphere that belongs to no one. 192 national borders, 192 economic priorities, trying to shoehorn nature to fit our agendas. It will never work unless we subordinate our priorities to the limits imposed by nature itself. For me, for me, the Occupy movement is about ecos, the Greek word for household or domain. It's about defining our place in community, in the state, in the nation, and in the biosphere. What is our home? And how do we live in it sustainably, with opportunity and meaning and happiness as our highest aspirations? Oi ecos is home. Ecology is the study of home. Economics is its management. But we elevate economy above ecology. For five years, the Prime Minister of Canada has never acknowledged the reality of human-induced climate change or that Canada, or that Canada is the industrialized nation most vulnerable to its impact. And now he's cutting back on scientists in Environment Canada and research on climate, so then we don't have to listen to the facts. Mr. Harper has steadfastly said, we can't reduce greenhouse gas emissions because it will destroy the economy. First of all, it's not true. Sweden, a northern industrialized country like us, has a carbon tax, has reduced its greenhouse gas emissions 8% below 1990 levels, while its economy grew by 44%. But more egregious, Mr. Harper lifts the economy above the very air that keeps us alive. Let's put the eco back into economics. There's an old, there's an old saying that money talks. I've talked to a lot of loonies, but they've all been people. Money may literally talk, may not literally talk, but today it controls and sets the agenda for our governments. Occupy is not just about the 1% who continue to rake in an ever-increasing proportion of society's wealth, while 99% bear the real cost. Occupy is about corporate power. Corporations have become bigger than most governments on the planet, and they are no longer bound by national borders, laws, or standards. Occupiers know because so many of you are young that the terrible inequities represented by the 1% today are also intergenerational. Today's corporations and the super rich are increasing wealth at the expense of generations to come, exhausting resources, extinguishing species, poisoning air, water, and soil. Yet economists discount the estimated costs of these problems that will be most strongly felt by successive generations to come. Have you ever heard a politician call for mass spending for the sake of future generations? Or children who can't vote? Or for youth who don't bother to vote? Why does the government that we elect to look after our well-being and our future act as a cheerleader for corporate sectors because money talks. For years, the auto sector fought every progressive innovation from seat belts to catalytic converters to mileage targets to, to airbags. It will cost too much. We'll be put out of business. Let the markets rule. Don't legislate. Trust us, is what they said. For 10 years, Chrysler had data that proved airbags save lives. Yet for years, the auto sector fought Ralph Nader 
while hundreds of thousands of people who could have been saved by airbags died. And when their beloved free market shifted to favor foreign companies, those bastions of free enterprise came crawling to governments and asked for bailouts. David Lewis was right, they're corporate welfare bums. And they got the money. But they got the money with very few strings attached.